Anya, please request you to please take over. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shilpa. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Uh, I, Sanya, uh, on behalf of NPPA, welcome you all again to the symposium titled Findings from the Field. Uh, the speakers for this session are Mr. Milesh. Yes. And, yes, sure. Please. Okay, sir. I'm just connecting the fourth call. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, so the speakers for this session are Mr. Milesh and Ms. Gracie. And I would briefly like to introduce you to our speakers. Uh, Mr. Milesh is the founder and managing trustee of Altruist. Altruist was established to work for the benefit and upliftment of mentally ill people as he has his younger brother suffering from schizophrenia since 1996. Altruist as an organization has taken up some path-breaking projects, such as Dava and Dua, which is working in a Darga, providing modern medical and mental health service to people who come to the shrine in search of faith-based care. Adhar, the helpline for wandering mentally ill people, is another project he's working in the city of Ahmedabad and Vadodara, rescuing the destitute mentally ill, admitting him in the hospital, and for the mental health care and treatment. So once the patients are recovered, uh, a rapper is established with them uh, by the psychologist and social worker, and they address the families and they are found and reunited. We welcome you, Mr. Amlai, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, about Ms. Gracie, uh, Ms. Gracie is a clinical psychologist by profession. Since May 2022, she has a different role at Corstone. She works as a special advisor there. Before joining Corstone in 2012, Ms. Gracie was with Sangat Society, a Goa-based NGO that has been a leader in the field of mental health since its inception in 1996. At Corstone, she is spearheaded in 2013, she spearheaded in 2013 and 14 as one of the largest effectiveness trials on resilience program ever conducted in a low middle income country. She is a co-author of several publications in India and globally and has contributed to training resources at national level in India, including the Rashtra Kishore Swasthya Karyakram and more recently Ayushman uh, Bharat, uh, Bharat program. She was recently appointed as a member of World Health Organization uh, uh, Guidance Development Group for the promotional programs on global adolescent mental health. We welcome you, Ms. Gracie. And uh, this session will be chaired by Dr. Pulkit Khanna. Dr. Pulkit Khanna is an associate professor and vice dean at Jindal Institute of Behavioral Sciences at OP Jindal Global University. She was also certified in positive psychology, research education and application in community health at uh, the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Nibhans, Bangalore. Her research looks at strengthening student well-being, exploring indigenous practices that promote positive psychological constructs. We welcome you, Dr. Pulkit, and I request you to take over. Thank you, Sanya. Good evening, everybody. After this uh, absolutely wonderful session, um, the keynote session with Professor Antonella and Dr. Tayyab Rashid, it's my pleasant duty to chair this final session, the final symposium session of the first international NPPA conference before we head into the closing ceremony. A uh, warm welcome again to our speakers for the symposium, Mr. Milesh Hamlai and Ms. Gracie Andrew. I will uh, request Mr. Milesh to first begin with this session, followed by Ms. Andrews, after which we will open to Q&A from the audience. Over to you, Mr. Milesh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pulkit. Thank you, Sanya. Uh, it is a pleasure to be on this uh, uh, symposium as a part. Um, I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I am, uh, I am from a um, commerce background. I was into the world where we used to only talk about the bottom lines. I come from a for-profit sector. And uh, it is all thanks to a couple of psychiatrists working in the government who pushed me to work for the people. 
because of my brother's experience as a family member because i've been taking care of him since since almost like 26 27 years so that is how the journey began of altruist in 2006 and i started working and the first project was uh, dawa and dua which i i had never even stepped into any of the dargahs in my life till almost uh, 35 37 years and this was the first platform where i got an opportunity i went and met them i'll share the screen and that is how it began um this is wait uh, wait so okay okay so um this was the name which uh, uh, struck me in 2006 and that is how i named my organization as altruist because the meaning of altruist was to work selflessly for others and uh, when uh, when i was actually taking care uh, for my brother in the hospitals in the government mental hospitals even in the private hospitals i saw a resemblance uh, a lot of resemblance in other people like what i faced uh, the challenges handling him and that is how we started this first project and uh, we started a stab- we established it in the year 2007 before that i worked with uh, i worked on some projects uh, uh, mapping the data of mental health of gujarat uh, uh, the data has been uploaded on uh, who website and uh, that is how slowly and gradually i stepped into this world we started the first service was dawa and dua and then we also were working in the field under the district mental health program uh dawa and dua uh, dawa and dua basically uh, was a project which was uh, in <clears throat> in lieu to the uh, incident that happened on uh, 6th of august 2001 where uh, 25 to 30 people were churned to death uh, due to a fire outbreak and of course the 6th of august is supposed to be regarded as a black day in mental health so uh, after the human rights uh, national human rights intervention and the supreme court uh, they directed all the chief secretaries uh, chief secretaries of the states to ensure that all such people who were languishing at such shrines holy shrines i wouldn't say a muslim shrine i'm not i'm not trying to say that but it is i mean there have been instances where uh, mentally have been languishing at hindu shrines christian shrines uh, muslim shrines so they were instructed to transfer them to the right kind of facilities where they could get proper treatment medical treatment in fact so the darga of uh, miradata emerged out in gujarat and uh, this happened in 2000 uh, they, in 2003 uh, they, the patients were chained and kept there which was shut down by the government but there was there had to be an alternative because there was a flow of people coming out to such kind of shrines in search of faith based care because people were poor people did not have money to go to a doctor it was expensive so the only first source uh, first source of solution was such kind of shrines so this was the darga which was identified and then in 2004 5 the government started this project but it did not sustain and then there was a vacuum for couple of years and then in 2007 we were identified to start this project i mean of course when i started this project i never realized that it would it would go on a mass scale and uh, we started this project where we started training the muslim priests on signs and symptoms of uh, mental illnesses and they started referring the patients to us and we have a psychiatric opd running uh, every day where we have around 30 to 50 patients in op where we treat them and we send them back to these priests and these priests uh, turn the uh, medicines over the uh, shrine and then they tell the patients to start the medicines and the family members and then the counseling starts people get in touch with them and, and slowly and gradually uh, whether it is the dawa which is curing them or dua which is curing them is not we want to know but you just want to know that the person starts getting Uh, person starts recovering so this is one kind of a platform where we were able to amalgamate religion and science together where everybody holistically started looking at recovery of the person rather than the methods so 
this unique concept is to provide mental health services to the population who have not access, who have not access to the mental health or access in past. So in 2008, when I re, I go back, um, uh, there were a lot, very less psychiatrists in the country. And in, in fact, we did not have a psychiatrist in the government system. It was only in the privates. And they were also situated in the major cities. So this was one of the points where majority of the uh, persons with psychiatric issues were, psychological issues were found. So without disturbing their faith, we wanted to ensure that they also avail medical treatment. This project today uh, is fully functional thanks to the state government. It has been very active. The government has been very supportive. And we have been able to touch base more than 1 lakh patients uh, uh, in the last 14 years. And the numbers are increasing. Now what has happened is the people are coming to the shrine in search of medical care also. It is just not about faith-based care, but they are also coming for medical care because they know that they get psychiatric treatment at this Dargah. So this Dargah is actually becoming very famous in both the ways. This Dargah actually um, uh, got us at, um, uh, uh, attention on Satyamev Jayate. We had National Human Rights Commission visiting this project for two days. They observed the entire program and they have recommended this program in the other states and this program has uh, been it has been it has been replicated in uh, ervadi darga in tamil nadu uh, they have dava and Dua working since 2014 in some place in karnataka also this program has been replicated and so on people are looking at this kind of programs where they are able to come and address the issues of people with psychological disorders we also started uh, a helpline known as Aadhaar to rescue destitute, destitute mentally ill in 2011 in Ahmedabad, followed in Vadodara. We, uh, we, we linked with the government. And this program was started uh, adhering to the section of uh, Mental Health Act, nine, former Mental Health Act 1987, Section 23, and now it has been followed under sex, uh, Mental Health Care Act 2017, Section 100. So we are adhering to these acts, uh, sections of these acts, and we are rescuing these people. Of course, it is the duty of the police, but we help the police and we rescue them. We obtain a court order and then they are admitted in the mental hospitals for treatment. Once they start recovering, our psychologists establish a rapport with them. They uh, try to find their names and addresses and then we are able to reunite them with their families. And in these, uh, in this helpline, we have seen almost more than 65 to 70,000 patients in last uh, 12, 13 years in both the cities. And uh, the numbers are mind boggling. We never expected that these would be the numbers. Today, our Dawadwa OPD is almost like uh, a bigger OPD than any psychiatry, uh, a medical college psychiatry department, because sometimes we cross the OP numbers beyond 100. And at times we get calls which are more than 30 calls in a day where we are able to rescue these people and, you know, bring them to proper security, care and shelter. This is how we have been working. We are, we are working with the government. We are working with private stakeholders. We are working with uh, the police. And we ensure that no person is left over on the street um, uh, just to, you know, uh, without any attention. So we have been working very strictly. And this, 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 both these projects are giving us very good results. Um, we have taken prior appoint, uh, letters and consent. So these are the patients which we found on the roads and we reunited them with their families and now they are living with their families in a very happy condition. So this is these are just a few uh, faces. Uh, we also facilitate uh, disability certificates, disability allowances from the Department of Social Justice and Empowerment. We uh, facilitate... Uh, 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 occupational therapy at uh, hospitals for mental health for cure patients so that they can come in the morning and then they could go back. So this is working wonders for us and uh, the patients are really finding some, in fact, the family members are finding a lot of solace in this kind of services. Uh, these are the words from uh, National Human Rights Commission and uh, uh, they've, uh, they've highly recommended both the projects and 
uh, they have told the other states to replicate these projects. We have a large fellowship who support us with uh, initial funding in 2016 and we have started a, a psychosocial rehabilitation center at Unava where our Dawa and Dua project is. So we help them, uh, provide them with psychosocial, uh, our psychologists work with them. They come during the day and then they go back in the evening. So that way we help, we, we let them work on making paper bags, do some embroidery as per their own interests, because that is very important. We have made some chai masalas, we made some vegetable masalas and all these, all these, all this work is done by these patients. So there are dual benefits. One is that these patients are occupied and the other is that the family members are also at ease that they know that they are at a safe place and they can do their work very happily at home. That's it. I would be very happy to take any questions and answers from the people. Thank you, Mr. Amlai, for your presentation. I would request you to stop sharing the screen. Thank you for, uh, you know, summing up the journey of this project in such a short span of time. Aptly, this session is titled Findings from the Field, and uh, you nicely encapsulated what a powerful idea can do. I'm sure our audience have uh, a lot of questions and curiosities, but uh, we will first go over to Ms. Gracie Andrew for her presentation and then come back to you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Andrew, I guess we are able to see the presenter view. So we are able to see how it should be on your screen. You may want to reshare this, please. Hello, is this better? Um, I'll request you to stop sharing once and reshare this, please. This is perfect. Okay. Okay. And I didn't even realize I was in mute. <laughs> yeah. And I was just congratulating Mr. Nilesh for the work, inspiring work uh, uh, that I heard about. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a very different journey right here in India that we've had with an intervention that we took uh, from a small pilot to scale in the state of Bihar. And uh, I have some research. So it's diverting a little bit into, you know, very uh, slightly academic research where we found evidence and we and how we took it to scale. It's a 10 year journey. Uh, yeah. So first of all, about Costone. So Costone is an organization that I work with. And we work at an excess of resilience, gender, health, and education. So we've been in the last 10 years developing evidence-based personal resilience program that has taken a, a, a lot of uh, concepts uh, from positive psychology. Quite a, almost 60 to 70% of our work comes from the field of positive psychology. And we work to empower you to reframe the identity, unleash the potential, and reset their life trajectory. So Coston is a US-based nonprofit organization, but we also have Coston Air Foundation in India. We have two offices, one in Delhi and one in Bihar. We develop school and community-based training programs that focus on building resilience and well-being for youth, women, parents, different groups. But today I'm going to talk more about girls first and youth first. 
And these are programs that have been, are being conducted in schools. These programs integrate psychosocial resilience uh, and adolescent physical health. Uh, it is done in small groups by teacher facilitated, if teacher facilitated, and it's a peer support model where children sit in a group in a circle and the teacher facilitates the program. We focus on 12 to 16 year olds, seven and eight groups. What we use is a train a trainer model where cost on either trains local partners and right now of course the government uh, we train the master trainers the master trainers train teachers of program facilitators and then they take the program to the students what exactly is uh, is included what's the model uh, we, we we work from inside out so a lot of the first part of the program is about self discovery You've heard so much in the last two days, I'm sure, you know, I don't have to say much. Uh, it's self-discovery about friends, what do I feel, what do I want. It goes into skills for growth, like emotional regulation, how do you set your goals, problem solving, communication, resolving conflict. And finally, through a facilitated peer support approach that goes on in the schools, you, you have change in two areas. You have change at the individual level, there's individual transformation that we see, and then at a social level, where collectively the young people, the adolescents, tend to bring change in the community. One example would be where, you know, you, you teach them about building trust, teach children about listening skills, we teach them about character strengths. They learn about their own strengths, strengths in their peers and their family members, and how do they apply it. They th learn about goal setting. Then they learn about managing emotions and getting into concepts like forgiveness. How do you identify violence? How do you oppose violence? How do you solve problems in a group? How do we? How do you work on conflicts in a group? And and so on. And so So there's self-discovery, there's skills of inter and in, intrapersonal growth, and then that application goes to social justice and health, like you know your changes in adolescence, the changes that take place in their body, gender and rights, substance abuse. So so it's kind of it flows from the inside to the to the out. So uh, now I'm going to talk about how this program actually started in India and how it, it reached scale. So we started with, so this is the, this is, uh, you know, this is our journey where we started with the pilot. I'm going to take you through some of this. Uh, and, and we then went into validation and building evidence, followed by implementation science to see how it fits into the system. And now we're in the process of scaling the program to entire, into the entire state of Bihar. So when we when we started the program in India, nobody actually you know understood the concepts of resilience at least at the government level, and when we especially when we spoke about emotional resilience. So we started with very small pilots, which were done in Delhi with hundred girls and followed by a thousand girls in Surat, and here we were just looking at the feasibility of the program. At this point, we were just asking, is the resilience program? And when I say resilience, you know, I mean a lot of it is from positive psychology. Is it culturally re relevant to a you know, low income setting in India? Can this be facilitated by local women and local teachers? Is there a general acceptance for this? So these are the kind of questions we were asking when we piloted the program. So it was done with 100 girls, students, and we found that when we looked at the ratings, they did find it relevant to their daily life. It was a, had a positive impact in relationships with friends and family. They talked about being able to handle problems, and they felt that their communication with family and friends had really improved. We also found that school attendance was highest on the days when the program was conducted. We followed by more pilots in Surat, and we had similar results. 
There were lots of difficulties operationally in conducting the programs in schools, but still we found an impact in terms of less aggression, fewer fights in classes, girls being able to better manage. They talked about being able to manage their anger. Students were less shy. Participants learned to listen to others. So these were the findings that we found in Surat. We also did some pilots in Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh, where we worked in urban slums, rural areas, we tested with boys, girls, and these were with small partner organizations and very similar uh, uh, changes that we found over time on different scales that we used to uh, look at the impact. So all these lessons from the pilot studies told us that this program is well received and it has a positive impact. The train the trainer model is a feasible model to be used, and it is possible to train local women with limited education as trainers. Now, our next step was that we have to build evidence about the program. We have to show how effective it is. So we actually got into uh, a randomized control trial. And this was the assessment framework that we used, where we looked at impact at different levels mental, emotional, physical, social, and academic. And we use different scales. We piloted these in the community, validated them, and then got into uh, developing them into questionnaires or tools to, uh, to do uh, the assessment. And in this, we, this was a randomized control trial with 3,400 girls from 76 schools. We trained 70 community women who conducted the programs as an after-school program for these girls. And there were four arms, of which one got just the resilience curriculum, one got health, one got resilience and health, and one was schools as control. And again, the girls met in small groups. They met once or twice per week, six to eight months. That was the program uh, period. And uh, when we did the trial, we had two community program facilitators per group. And these are some of the findings that we found. And if you look at it, you can see this huge uh, increase in uh, emotional resilience, self-efficacy, and even in the areas of health knowledge, clean water behavior, or gender uh, equality attitude. So this is what we found in our first RCT. There are many more findings, and there are many more pa there are papers published, but I'm not going to get into all, you know, showing you all, all this, but one special specific uh, slide that shows school engagement. And we found that school engagement is really high in both the one that got only resilience and the one that got resilience and health. And it was much lower in the one to the control groups and the one that got only health. We also did a lot of qualitative interviews. We looked at what problems were faced in Bihar. In rural Bihar, we all know, you know, there is, Early marriage is a big problem, unsafe environment, uh, partial treatment in, at, uh, in their homes. And what we found was girls but in, the, in the interviews talked about four skills that, they, that helped them thrive. They talked about self-realization of their feelings, to be able to validate those feelings. They talked about courage to act up on the feelings and opinions. They talked about setting goals and long-term perspective on where they want to go. And the skills used, for, they were able to use it and it actually benefited the community as a whole. This is just a quote of a girl who says of how she convinced her father that he should wait about getting his sister married. Uh, another one where the girl is actually able to articulate how she used courage, perseverance, and affection. Which, which she talked about as beneficial quality. And you, you must have heard so much about character strength. But this is how the girl here is articulating how she used her strengths in uh, solving her problem or the difficulties that she was facing. So the next phase, once we built evidence about the program, uh, we went into, now how do we take this to scale? How do we really get rationalized within the government setting? And we spent a couple of years doing what we call implementation science, where we worked at 
scale in a large number of schools, trying to see what are the processes that we have to follow to be able to get this to the kids, to the teachers. So we did, uh, you know, we conducted the program and during this period, we used a lot of before and after, uh, that is pre post. And we saw that even when we did it through the teachers, when we trained the teachers and supported them to conduct the program in groups in schools, we still could see that there was a change pre and post. And you can see these within the psychosocial indicators, you can see this within the physical health indicators. And this was seen, these positive trends were seen continuously for a number of years. And I just have a few uh, you know, slides that just to show you the, the flow in terms of the change that one sees over the years. You can see that in 2016, 2017, some of the qualitative highlights of 16, 17, where the kids were about, the girls were and boys were talking about, you know, the program taught me that girls and boys are equal. These sessions gave me strength to be more confident. I told my mother, brother, and sisters also about listening skills. So, so they were able to actually take the skills to their homes and share it with their family members. And some most uh, posts that are there that really show you how how these students could internalize the skills and share it with, the, with their family and friends. And then you have 18, 19 again, showing the change. Uh, and then you have 19, 20, where within scale up, so we kind of increased the number of schools and districts. And here we were looking at knowledge around these concepts and you find the difference uh, between baseline and end line in how they identify their emotions and manage them, how they set goals, and also their responses to puberty, hygiene, et cetera. You also see girls first KGB where we, uh, KGB we actually use Kasturba Gandhi, uh, Balika Vidyalaya. These are residential schools uh, that are there in, uh, in, in every block of Bihar and, and most states. And in these schools, you have girls coming from very marginalized uh, SESC uh, populations uh, and they live here, they're residential schools and they uh, most often attend a government school that is close to the, uh, to the residential uh, place. And again, you see that, uh, you can see the difference in their health knowledge and, and resilience. The same thing in 1920, so you can see the change in because in agency, in society, in aspiration, where they can say they, they they were able to say that I believe I have many character strengths, I have goals, I strongly disagree that I would uh, switch to marriage under age of 18, so and so on. So a lot of the attitude questions that are here, you can see the difference after the girls go through the program. Again, qualitative. Highlights increased level of confidence, improved goal setting, improved student teacher relationships, greater courage to stand up to their classmates and use assertive communication. And once we did that, uh, we, we kind of disseminated, did implementation science, and we worked very closely with the government on how to how can we demonstrate. And how can we work on a scale-up model? How can this be integrated within the system? And that's where we are now. So between by 2025, what we're doing is, what we've been doing and what we're doing now is we're establishing a foundational presence in school in a few districts and KGBs. We're utilizing this demonstration model of code to show how this can be institutionalized within the system and then slowly planning to multi-phase, uh, it, it's a plan of a multi-phase approach of handover where we will, now this program will go through the diets, diets are district education training centers and the SCRT. Uh, and this, the material, some of the materials will go into textbooks and through the diets, the training will go to the teachers and the teachers will be doing the program in school. So yeah, with that, 
I stop here uh, and I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Gracie Andrew, for that wonderful presentation. We'll now open the session for any questions or comments or feedback from the audience. We'll request you to please post your questions in the Q&A chat box. While they do that, um, I would want to take this opportunity to thank both of you, Ms. Gracie Andrew and Mr. Milesh. It's very, very heartening to see uh, findings from the field, such uh, impact-focused work from two diverse regions in India. In fact, as they often say, you know, we saved the best for the last. So while all the sessions over the past two days have been really enlightening for the audience, it's very nice how this work that started from a small idea has cascaded to such meaningful impacts, something which is so much in line with the vision of NPPA when it was first established about a decade ago. So it's great to see how your work has shaped up respectively. We have Ms. Garima Sharma in the audience just appreciating your work and saying that she's greatly inspired by both of your work. Thank you. I do have another question for both of you and anybody could go first. Whenever any work of this nature, um, you know, when you take it to the field, I believe both Bihar as well as uh, Mr. Milesh, the location you mentioned, particularly in the uh, you know, breaking into the space of a religious shrine, there would be resistance to change. Both of the sociocultural context would not be very welcoming of something that's challenging the status quo. Could you take us through some of the challenges you faced and what kept you going? Gracie, would you like to answer first? No, you go on. Okay. There was a lot of resistance initially. <clears throat> I'm basically a Hindu and uh, it was a challenge for me to get into the Darga. And the only thing uh, which actually motivated me was, first of all, was the experience that I had handling my brother. You know, you see uh, happening at home every day, the doctors, the psychologists, they're always there just to address it for a couple of minutes or probably a session of an hour. But what happens is when we come back home with them, we have to bear them for three, 24, 365. There's no holiday for us. There is no uh, kind of uh, uh, happiness in doing anything when a person is completely in a different state of mind. So when I visited the shrine and uh, the, the initial impact uh, was to meet these uh, priests and uh, they understood everything but it was again it is also their livelihood so it was an impact on their livelihood so they resisted tremendously finally it took us almost like four months to break that mental status and make them understand that we are not going to harp on your business let them be the way they are. We are not wanting to challenge your uh, income. Neither we will also ask them how much do you pay them. And that is how uh, we were able to break through. The first OPD that started and in, 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 in uh, 2008, we, we started the first OPD on 28th of July, I distinctly remember. And the psychiatrist was there, of course. And from 2008 to 2014, we ran the OPD in their own premise, in the Darga Trust Office. And it was very challenging. We used to face problems every day. The, the Mujawas used to look at us in a very different way. They used to threaten us. But our objective was very clear that we wanted to treat these people. And uh, uh, when the families came to us, I, I have attended a lot of OPDs along with my psychiatrists and psychologists. I could see the same thing, the same agony that I was going through every day or even I go through today. I mean, I knew what they were going through and how it could help them. I have counseled those families myself. I said, let your prayers go on. We are not wanting to challenge your faith. We are neither wanting to challenge the faith of, of those who are praying on your behalf. I sat with them. I ate with them. And that is how the mindset started changing. 
it has taken almost uh, it is it has been almost one one and a half decade we are we are sitting in the darga for last 15 years now this is the 15th year going on and it is increasing and today what has happened is the biggest change see this is positivity what i what, what i think it does these priests they they are able to diagnose sir i mean they'll say that sir he's suffering oh, he, they'll talk in hindi they'll say sir isko shayad depression hai you know this is the training that speaks this is the the knowledge that has been shared to them speaks sir isko psychosis lag raha hai sir isko schizophrenia hai although they'll be doing their prayers and everything we don't want to challenge it it's a different platform altogether i respect that platform i respect all the faith and today they come to us today we have a lot of patients from these priest families we've got more than 100 patients whom we are treating for mental retardation and for mental illnesses and they come and tell us dusre ko mat batayega don't tell somebody else otherwise we'll be in a problem it will be our our ego which will get affected we keep that silent we keep that anonymity we keep that uh, respect we keep that secret and it goes on and today they refer the patients to us because we don't know what is the footfall in the darga that darga is big there are people flocking in right from morning 6 o'clock till 9 o'clock at night but they identify the patients and they send it to us and that is our breakthrough that is how we have been able to change the mindset of the people they have believed in the medical system and the medical system works i mean uh, dr uh, professor antonola what she said was like it is very right that you see Uh, with with the problem people can still live a happy life you know Do- dr uh, tayyab also i agree with him i mean you know they all have problems but they want to accept it in their own way they don't want to open it up and that is how we have taken that simple path of transparency uh, uh, probably uh, very big it, transparency is the core basically we share everything with them and we send the patients back to them we said to them that okay the medicines have been given now you go back to your priest so the priest will take the medicines he'll, he'll roam it over the mazar and then he'll, he'll say that oh, i will start eating the medicines and the best part is we have made them lay counselors so they monitor the medicine uh, they administer the medicine they ask the families have, have they taken the medicines are they feeling okay in case if they're not feeling okay go and show the doctor tomorrow okay so this is the change we've been able to bring in and this is a positive change my brother probably was instrumental my motivator because of him probably i was destined to do something and i'm doing something which i never knew that which would grow beyond my capacity it's huge thank you more power to you and the dawa and dua project thank you thank you so much miss crazy would you like to come in yeah so when we started our program of course there was resistance from the teachers and you know uh, when we you know got into school uh, because they kept saying what the, they keep getting trained in so what is this new training that they were making us go to and as we were looking at their responses what we realized is the best way to get to them is for them to feel the program to be able to internalize the program in their own lives so we focus a lot on the teachers problem and then how do they use resilience to deal with their life problems and when they got touched they became our champion they were ready to do the program and from the lessons from the teachers what we did is when we scaled up we started working with all stakeholders by actually making them experience the program so whether it was a block office or whether it was a a principal of a school we gave orientation to everyone and made them realize that they can apply these principles to their own lives and that's how we got a buy in at different levels so then we didn't have to champion for it they went to the state level and said oh this program is important we need it and that's you know how we broke the resistance so clearly both of your inspiring journeys do reinforce actually you know your findings from the field actually mirror what literature always tells us that for any intervention of this sort to be sustainable and make an impact it's very important to get the community and stakeholders on board and uh, i'm sure your respective journeys inspire many emerging researchers and academics because 
many of us are trained to study it academically, but do not see the challenges that the field poses or do not brace ourselves for what it could be. But this I'm sure is inspiring and is you know something that will bridge a lot of optimism for people. I do see at this point, uh, although we are nearing the end of our session, that two of our attendees have raised their hands. Would you want to post a question? Um, Sanya, could you please help here? Would they be able to ask or can they post their question? Two attendees have raised their hands. Uh, they they'll have to type the questions. We can't uh, unmute them. unmute them, right? So, uh, Ms. Sherin and uh, Ms. Varsha, in case you had a query, we'll encourage you to please post it in the Q and A chat box. Okay, um, perhaps they did not have a question. It just happened to be case of the hand being raised, the interesting things that technology does to us. So um, in that case, uh, we will formally close this session and I'll hand this back to our session moderator, Sanya, to please take it forward. Thank you once again to our presenters of the symposium. It was great to listen to both of you. Thank you, Dr. Pulkit. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Pulkit, for chairing the session and moderating, uh, connecting us with Mr. Uh, Milesh and Ms. Gracie. And thank you, Mr. Milesh and Ms. Gracie for enlightening us with your experience and research. Uh, your talks have actually given insights about the reality, which is actually the need of the hour. And uh, thank you attendees for your presence. Uh, I, on behalf of NPPA, appreciate and acknowledge your presence for the session. Uh, please continue staying with us for the closing ceremony. I now hand over the session to Dr. Shilpa to, to handle over the, the closing ceremony.